welcome to Adventure Sport. In today's episode, I'm going to show you the basic steps on how to solder, as well as my top three tips to avoid some of the pitfalls and get the best possible soldering joints. I'll also show you what equipment and soldering supplies you'll want, and some of the ones you don't. Soldering is fairly easy as long as you do a few things right each time. To get the best results, make sure you always have good heat, good clean, and good flux. Once your iron is fully heated, wipe the tip off and then tin the end with some solder. Next, put flux on the areas you intend to solder and then tin each of the parts. You want to apply the heat to your target workpiece and then quickly bring the solder to it. Once the parts are tinned, simply melt them together. Most often, if the pieces are well tinned, you won't have to add any additional solder. But if you're doing a long joint like soldering wires together, you may need some extra to get a good solid joint. On small circuits, you can just dab a bit on your soldering tip and then touch it to the part, but it's really better if you can do it the other way whenever possible. Always checking these three key points will help ensure solid, clean looking bonds. To ensure you have good heat, you need to start with a soldering iron that's at least 25 watts. A 30 or a 40 watt is better still. Next, you need to make sure you have good clean and that starts with your soldering tip. When solder remains hot, it gets oxidized on your tip and this causes it to have a dull look. If your tip looks like this, it won't melt the solder. The best way to clean it is by wiping it off on a brass sponge. Some people use a damp kitchen type sponge. However, I prefer the brass because it's more effective and doesn't seem to lower the temperature of the tip as much. Most of the time you won't need to clean the component you're working on, but there are some cases where it's helpful. Brass or copper parts that have been heavily oxidized are a good example. Take these brass beads. Trying to solder directly to the patinaed surface is not easy. I can get a bead to sit on there and eventually when it gets hot enough it will stick. However, if I lightly sand the surface to a shine, the brass takes solder more easily. This brings us to our next tip. Using good flux will make a tremendous difference in the way that your solder flows and bonds to the metal. In most cases, this will eliminate the need for any cleaning of the part. Flux will both penetrate the existing oxides and prevent new ones from forming during the soldering process until it evaporates. A good rule of thumb to know whether or not you're doing it correctly is if the joint is made within one or two seconds. If you find yourself feeling the need to push hard on the workpiece, it probably means something's wrong. 90% of the time I've found this issue stems from improper heat. If the component you're working on has too much mass for the iron you're using to quickly heat the surface of the metal, you'll have trouble getting the solder to wet. This can also cause what's known as cold joints. Basically, the solder will melt and sit on the workpiece, but either have a very poor or brittle bond or none at all. One of the more common places flashlight modders will run into this is when they're trying to solder a driver board into a pill. Typically, I just crimp the rim of the pill in this situation, but if you really feel like you need to solder the board in, here's some tips that can help. Number one is if you have a short, fat tip for your soldering iron. That'll help transfer the heat more quickly and also keep the tip from cooling as fast when it contacts the metal. Another thing you can do is raise the temperature of the workpiece. I use either my electric skillet or a propane torch. Just be sure you don't get it so hot that it causes solder to melt on any attached components. Most often I heat it just hot enough so that you can touch it very quickly. Once this is done, you can see the solder actually bonds to the metal rather than cooling off on the top of it. If you're having trouble bridging the gap between the metal and the driver board, it helps to do a little and then let it cool a couple seconds and then add a little more. 
basically you want to tin the metal and tin the driver and let that cool and then fill in the gap with a quick touch of solder. It's time to show you my recommendations for equipment and supplies. I use the Weller WES-51 soldering station because it has a variable output up to 50 watts. For most flashlight related projects I keep it tuned to about 810 degrees. You can pick these up for around $100. If you're not ready to spend that much on a premium soldering station, you can still get a good soldering iron for around $20. I strongly recommend the Weller brand as a whole, except for the large gun type irons. These are just too clunky for most flashlight type modding. I also don't recommend buying one of the cheap soldering stations or irons you often see on eBay or many of the China websites. These look enticing because of all the bells and whistles they come with and because of the low cost of the product and replacement tips, but if you solder frequently, the lifespan of these units is about two months. Next, let's take a look at supplies. The solder I prefer is Kester 6337 No Clean Flux Core with a diameter of 0.031. I also use the EP256 soldering paste for reflow soldering projects. My choice of flux without a doubt is a Kester 951 No Clean Liquid. For projects requiring a heavier non-splatter type flux, I use RF7141 Tacky, which is great for hard to solder joints, rework, or on nickel plating. One other thing you may want to have around if you plan to do any soldering is some solder wick. It's handy for removing any accidental solder bridges you've made or extracting driver boards from a pill or module. The type of wire I most often use is a stranded wire with silicone outer coating. It's soft and pliable, yet the shrink on the outside is much more heat resistant than PVC coated wire. I also keep Teflon coated wire around because it's very tough and it has a thinner diameter compared to other wire in the same gauge. It's stiffer and hard to work with so I rarely use it. Finally, what how to solder tutorial would be complete without a look at the necessary tools for the job. I find the most helpful of all are my pair of hemostats. I keep a straight and a curved pair which are great for hard to reach places. I also have a jeweler's peg vise to hold small parts like drivers and pills in place. I also keep a pair of wire strippers with the gauge sizes marked on them. They're better for small work than the one size strips all type. So there you have it, my top three tips for getting the best possible solder joints. That's good heat, good clean, good flux. If you have any questions or helpful hints of your own, please let me know in the comments. I'll post links in the description to purchase the supplies you've seen. If you've enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.